welcome you to the opening of the spring lecture series sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant Program, Oceans Alive. And someone asked on their way in um, how many years we'd been doing this. And we think it's about 12 or 13 years, but we'll check on that. So, th and it always seems to um, arrive about the same time that spring on Cape Cod arrives. You know, we never schedule before late April or early May, knowing that Cape Cod springs are quite unpredictable. But thank you for coming. There's plenty of refreshments in the back. Um, we have three lectures lined up for this spring. Tonight, Larry Maiden will talk about his work on gelatinous zooplankton. Next week will be the family um, science night, and we'll have the first prize winners from the Falmouth High School Science Fair the Mashpee Science Fair and the Falmouth Academy Science Fair presenting their results. And we really encourage children to come because I, I think it's very rewarding for young children to see how successful high school students can be in, in identifying a problem and, and pursuing it. Um, and then we will also have other top place winners from each of those fairs present posters of their work. So it'll be a, a, a nice evening to meet these young scientists and interact with them um, over some refreshments on their projects. And the third week uh, will be presented by Dale Levitt of the uh, Woods Hole Sea Grant staff on um, converting a cranberry bog for fish culture. So there's three very exciting weeks, and I hope to see you back at um, next week and the week after. But tonight's presentation will be done um, by Larry Maiden. Larry is a, a close colleague in Woods Hole. He's been in the biology department for uh, a few years. He just stepped down as department chair of the biology department. He is now the director of the new Ocean Life Institute. And Larry has um, done some amazing work on gelatinous zooplankton from the early days that he arrived in Woods Hole he studied their morphology, he studied their behavior, their physiology. Um, he is an, uh, a very artistic photographer, and I'm sure he'll delight us with some of his photographs this evening as well. And the title of his talk is The Jellies Versus the Fish. Larry? Thank you, Judy. Remember to turn this on. Okay. Now that should make it easier to hear me, I hope. Uh, well, I want to welcome you all to the first uh, of the, this year's Oceans Alive talks, and, uh, and also welcome you to our newly refurbished auditorium, for those of you who have not perhaps uh, been in it already. Uh, as Judy said, I am going to talk about the jellies versus the fish. And uh, this is uh, mostly from my perspective as someone interested in, in gelatinous animals. And I'm going to talk about a variety of jellies, but with a focus on the tinafores or comb jellies, which have, uh, in the last decade or so, become uh, uh, very notorious as enemies of fish in a number of uh, parts of the world. Uh, I'd like to uh, point out that uh, what I'm going to talk about is not all work that I've done myself. And there are a number of other people whose work is, is included, represented here. Uh, Becky Raposa, uh, my uh, graduate student that, that Judy mentioned, uh, is, uh, has been working on this for several years. And she currently has a, another project on her hands, a project that's about five and a half weeks old and about this tall. And uh, so that's, uh, that's keeping Becky busy uh, right now. Uh, Rich Harbison in our department has been working on uh, tinafores and their effects on fisheries for many years. And as a matter of fact, at this moment, he is in Azerbaijan attending a United Nations sponsored conference on the problem of introduced tinafores in uh, the Caspian Sea. Um, but he has uh, uh, very kindly provided some of the information that I'm going to show you tonight. Uh, Barbara Sullivan is a researcher at the University of Rhode Island uh, who has been working on the tinafore Nemeopsis in Narragansett Bay for many years. She has also kindly provided some information for tonight. Jefferson Turner is a researcher at the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth who has uh, some additional information. Tim Silva, who is in the back of the room there, has helped me put the video together. And he's going to help me try to balance this uh, three-ring circus between transparencies, slides, and video. So bear the with us. We'll try to get through it all uh, during the course of the evening. And then I'd like to thank Tracy Crago and Kate Maiden for helping with getting everything ramped up for this 
production. So, first of all, let's consider the fish. The fish that we mostly care about in this part of the world, New England or cod and haddock, these are the life blood, you might say, of the historic New England fisheries. And as you know, these fish have been in serious trouble in New England for the last <clears throat> couple of decades, a serious decline in the fishery due to uh, a variety of factors, number one of which is overfishing. But there are various other natural factors that affect the survival of these and any other fish. And we are aware that a lot of adult fish are, fall prey to uh, larger predators other than people. And uh, that's a source of, of mortality for adult fish. But it's probably even more important when we think about the young life history stages of the fish. The, this using cod as an example, uh, fish lay a tremendous number of eggs. Uh, I'm not even sure what that number is on the top there. A million, a trillion, a trillion eggs. And with each stage, they, the number reduces by by a factor of 10 or more, so that going from the eggs to the first larval stage, which is a little tiny larval fish only a couple of millimeters long, you lose about a, a factor of 10 to 100. But the juvenile stage, you, you lose even more. And when you get down to the adult stage, you have only a fraction of the original number of eggs represented as adult fish. So what this means is that the losses in the early life history stages, the eggs and the larval stages, are really the most important controlling factors affecting the eventual population size of the fish. And these are the sizes, and these are the life history stages where some of these gelatinous animals, particularly the comb jellies, have the most impact on, on the fish. So that's uh, why they're uh, particularly important. Now, so those are the fish, or at least a representative sample of the fish. Now, what are the jellies? Let's uh, take a few minutes to look at what some of the jellies are. If we could begin with the slides, please, Tim. Uh, this is a pretty simple sort of a jelly. It has all the general features of a jellyfish. Uh, it's sort of an umbrella-shaped body. It has a lot of tentacles hanging down from it. The tentacles have stinging cells in them called nematocysts. And these cells are what contact and, uh, the prey. They sting it essentially injecting poison or toxin into the prey, which kills it and enables it to be pulled up by the tentacles into the central part of the jellyfish, which is the mouth and stomach. And if I could find a pointer, I would point to it. But uh, this is the, the basic uh, structure of a jellyfish. Now, this is only one kind of what we call jellies. and There are a number of others that I'm going to illustrate. Uh, the next slide, please, Tim. A slightly different uh, jelly, uh, perhaps a bit larger one, one that lives further offshore, and, and a fish hanging out with it. Now, uh, I'm going to talk tonight about how, uh, well, thank you. All right, great. About, uh, this is a great audience participation night. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a, a fish here, which you might think is in danger. But in fact, one of the relationships between jellyfish and fish is that the juvenile fish, like this one, live up inside here. And they actually are protected from their predators by living under the skirts of the jellyfish uh, and protected by the presence of the tentacles, which keep other bigger fish out of the way. Now, this doesn't always work. Uh, and if this fish is careless, it may find that it becomes lunch instead of a guest. But uh, this is one relationship. But the main thing we're concerned about is the jellyfish and the other jellies eating fish in various life history stages. Can we have the next slide, please? And here, in fact, is just that very thing happening. Here's the jellyfish. This is an underwater picture right here. It's got a rather long uh, stomach that hangs down in the middle. And most of the stomach is filled up with a fish. And you can see its little eyes there and its little fins sticking out to either side, a very unhappy fish. Uh, you may notice also that the fish is really quite large compared to the jellyfish that is eating it. This is one of the great advantages of being of animals that are made out of jelly. Uh, you can make yourself as big as necessary to stretch around whatever it is you're eating and in consume the entire thing. Now, it probably will take this jellyfish uh, a day or so, maybe longer, to digest that. And it may not catch another fish that big for, for weeks. You know, this is, this is uh, Thanksgiving dinner as far as this uh, fish is concerned. Next one, please, Tim. 
One of the biggest uh, jellyfishes that occurs in our waters is the lion's mane, cyania. Uh, this is a relatively small one, actually. Uh, they, they can easily get up to a foot or two in diameter, and much larger ones have been reported in the Arctic. Uh, but this is what commonly shows up on our coast in summer. It washes up on the beaches, sometimes in large numbers. Uh, you're likely to get stung if you swim into these things because it has a, a huge number of tentacles here. It preys on a variety of, of different prey items, including crustaceans and other kinds of jelly animals and, uh, and fishes. The next one, please. Now, moving away from the strict type jellyfish, uh, the tentacles that you see here hanging down in the water belong to something that's floating up on the top, a Portuguese man of war. It is not actually a true jellyfish. It's in a group called the Siphonophores. Zoologically, they are closely related to jellyfish, but they have many um, different features. But they do catch their food the same way with tentacles like this, which hang down. And in fact, the tentacles of the man of war, uh, when they're fully extended, uh, if the man of war was up there, they would be way down here on the floor, perhaps reaching out to the first row of seats. Uh, they're very extensible. And a typical prey for the Portuguese man of war are small or larval and juvenile fishes. There are also fishes that live safely within the tentacles, just like the previous one we saw in the jellyfish. There's a, a fish called Nomius, which sort of lives as a commensal with the Portuguese man of war and manages mainly because it's coated with mucus on its body to avoid getting stung. Next one, please. Now, this is a little harder to see, but this is another animal called a siphonophore related to the Portuguese man of war, a cousin of jellyfishes. And it is the one that is quite common in the Gulf of Maine, in our local New England waters. And I'll try to describe how it works to you a bit. It's a, an animal which is sort of colonial, or you might say modular in construction. It has a number of different components which serve different functions. The ones up here in this, in this part of the animal are strictly for, for propulsion, for locomotion. And they accomplish that by jetting out a little jet of water, sort of like a small jet engine, that causes the whole animal to move forward. And then beyond that, there's a, what's called a stem that has on it a number of individual separate mouth and stomach units. These are the things which catch the food and digest it. And each of those mouth and stomach units has a fishing line or a tentacle coming out from it that it uses to snare the prey with. Now, this animal can be extremely abundant in the Gulf of Maine sometimes, uh, either at the surface or down deep, and so much so that in some years it fouls the, the nets of fishermen to the extent that they really can't fish out there. It is a predator on small crustaceans, which makes it a competitor for fish, and also it catches uh, small fishes itself. OK, next one, please. Now, this is a somewhat unusual uh, gelatinous predator because this is an animal called a hydroid, which is an, an organism that normally lives attached to the bottom on a rock or something like that. It has a whole lot of little uh, polyps here, each of which has a, a ring of tentacles that it, they use, just like a jellyfish does, to sting and catch very small prey. These are very small only a few millimeters long, and so the things that they catch are also very small, usually. Now, I said this normally lives on the bottom, but we found that on George's Bank out here, these become disengaged from the bottom in some way that we don't quite know. They live floating around in the water. They grow and prosper and become healthy colonies, uh, and they act as very significant predators up in the water in a place where basically they don't belong. But they're there in such numbers that they make up about 90% of the total amount of plankton in the water. Next picture. We'll show that in addition to, uh, next one please. How big is, it? How big is that whole thing? Uh, probably a half an inch across. Quite small. Quite small. But they are able to catch larval fish. This is a larval codfish. There's its eye, there's the body, and its tail. And they do this by ganging up on it. Each individual polyp in the hydroid colony is much too small to eat the larval fish. But you see here, we get two of them hooked onto it. And sometimes there'll be three or four hooked onto it. And they sort of envelop it with their tentacles. And they actually are able to digest it externally without having to take it into their stomach cavities. So without even having to eat it, they just sort of wrap all these tentacles around. They get together, cooperate 
Now, it's a great metaphor, and they have this communal supper uh, in the form of a larval codfish, which means that this tiny little predator is a, capable of feeding directly. Now, in addition to that, it's a very good predator on two things that this would like to eat, namely the eggs and the small larval stages of copepods, the little crustaceans which are the main food of the fish. So it both competes with it and it eats it directly. So this is another way in which the jellies and the fish face off. Okay, could we have the next one please? Yes, question. Uh, the, the ones that are pelagic like this, floating, uh, is only one species that we know of so far around here. The rest of them all stay attached to the bottom where they're supposed to be. One of the other groups of animals that I'm really going to spend most of the time on tonight are the comb jellies or tenophores. And there's two particular types I want to talk about. This is one called Pleurobrachia. It's also called the sea gooseberry because this part is about the size and appearance of a gooseberry. But it has very long tentacles, as you see here. And these are also used for catching small prey. Now, these differ from jellyfishes that we saw before in that the tentacles do not sting. They're simply sticky. It's like a lot of uh, strings of uh, fly paper, you might say. And uh, little animals that swim along and bump into these get stuck. And then the tenophore pulls them up, as we'll see uh, shortly on the video, and, and eats them. So this occurs all up and down our coast here, uh, particularly in the winter and early spring. The next picture is another type of tenophore which has a very different body shape, as you can see. It doesn't have the long tentacles hanging out. And instead, it has surfaces here, which are called oral lobes. Oral because the mouth is located right there, and the stomach is all up this part. And these surfaces of the oral lobes are used in various ways to catch the small prey. And as we go on, I'll show you some more detailed work that my student Becky has done to show just how this works. Yeah. Ah, thank you. And I'm glad you asked. The colors you see right here, the prismatic colors, they're artificial in a sense. The animal is not really pigmented like that, but it has small structures running down its side called comb plates. And these are, it's like a series of little paddles, which when they flutter, they cause the animal to swim through the water. They propel it like a row of oars. But the plates themselves are made up of cilia, fused together, like fine hair-like cilia. And they are so, uh, at such a fine uh, diameter that this acts like a diffraction grating and it causes light to be broken up into these prismatic colors. Right, it's artificial light, we shine it on there and it, and it turns into all these rainbow colors. If you looked at this in the ocean, you wouldn't see that. So as, as I said, it's sort of partly artificial, partly natural. <laughs> Next picture, please. And do please interrupt if you have any questions. Uh, this is another uh, species. The first one I, I showed you is called Bolinopsis. This one's called Nemeopsis. Uh, this lives all up and down the coast of North and South America. And this is the one I'm going to talk about most because it's the one that has had the most significant effect on uh, fisheries in various parts of the world. It is similar to the one we just saw. Down here it has the oral lobes which are used to catch the prey. It ranges in size from uh, the, young, the smallest ones might be a quarter to a half an inch and the biggest ones might be as much as four or five inches high. This occurs very commonly in our waters here beginning in the late summer all the way through fall, sometimes as late as November or December. But in August and September it's extremely abundant sometimes right here in Woods Hole Harbor. Okay, let's see, we'll have the next picture please. Now, a lot of the pr what these animals eat are small planktonic animals like copepods. These are a couple of copepods. These are animals that are probably about four millimeters long, so that's uh, an eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch, something like that. Uh, these are the sort of the fodder of most of the larger animals in the sea. They, are, they, they themselves eat phytoplankton, they're herbivores, and they get eaten by many, many other things, including fish and other kinds of plankton. Next picture. Please, Tim, is uh, just an assortment of other kinds of small plankton. These are the uh, little larval stages of crabs, which swim around for a long time before they settle down to the bottom. This is all fodder for these uh, comb jellies, the tenophores, and for many of these other jellies. Next picture is a, a view inside 
the stomach. Now here's the comb jelly. This is a, a nemeopsis, a younger nemeopsis. And uh, inside its stomach here, there's an assortment of an assorted lunch, kind of a smorgasbord, uh, a few crustaceans, but also fish larvae that you see perhaps right there. There's its tail, its head up here, and a couple of other fish larvae that have been eaten by this tenophore. They have a nervous system. Uh, they do not have a brain. They don't have a central nervous system, but they do have a, a distributed network of, of neurons. Uh, the jellyfish are the same. They don't have a central brain, but a distributed neural network. But they're able to do quite remarkable things, even with such a simple system. Now, these are the species that are, occur around here and that act as predators or competitors for fish in our waters. Uh, I just want to show you a couple of other examples, uh, two other examples, in the next slide, of other kinds of comb jellies, other kinds of tenophores that have different diets. Uh, this is one here. This is the animal itself, its body. And its body is pretty much just a big open sack. It's all mouth and stomach. It has tentacles that you see here, and it uses those to snag the prey. But in this case, the prey is not one of these little crustaceans we've just seen, or even a fish larva. But it's another gelatinous animal which is inside it here. And in fact, this is a long chain of gelatinous animals connected together, which you would extend off the picture down here. And this is, this tenophore has grabbed onto that chain. It's engulfed one end of it. And it's just going to continue eating and digesting until the whole thing is gone. So it's another example of why it's great to be made out of jelly. And you can stretch around to feed on anything, no matter how big it is, almost, compared to yourself. The next picture, Tim. Uh, is another comb jelly, a different species. This is the top part of it here. Uh, the lobes would be down here out of the picture. Uh, this is a, a tenophore which is maybe a couple of inches across in this direction. And here's what it had for lunch, an octopus. Now, octopus is a pretty smart little creature, even a baby octopus, uh, but not smart enough to get away from the clutches of this gelatinous animal which has no brain, it has no teeth, it has no claws. This one doesn't even have any tentacles. It does this all just by grabbing things as they come along. So, excuse me? No, no, no eyes. No, it, 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 it acts uh, just on uh, touch and possibly chemical sense that we are just beginning to investigate. Well, that's a little bit of a tour of what some of the jellies are. And now I'd like to turn the slides off, if we could, and uh, talk a little bit more about how these things work. Uh, I said that a lot of what I'm going to show you tonight is based on the research that my student did with support from the Huey C. Grant program. And part of the reason she was working on this is that uh, we have an interest in the role of these gelatinous predators out in the Gulf of Maine and on George's Bank. There's been a program in place here at Woods Hole for about eight years now called GLOBEC, which is uh, investigating the uh, physical and biological forces that affect the survival of cod and haddock, uh, particularly the, the young larval stages on George's Bank. And one of those forces are predators of various kinds. And these jelly animals, particularly the tenophores and also some of the siphonophores and medusae are, and the hydroids that we saw, are all important predators that can affect the survival from the egg to the larval stage and from the larval stage to the juvenile. So she was interested in what are the actual mechanisms by which these comb jellies catch their prey that enables them to catch different kinds of prey, maybe with different degrees of efficiency. And if we know that about them, then can we make some predictions as to what kind of effect those tenophores might have if they were introduced into other environments? Because we know that they have been introduced into other environments, as I'll show you shortly. Uh, a lot of the work that she did, and we're going to be showing you some video now, so it's time to turn on the machine, uh, Tim. Uh, this video projector is it's very nice, but it has to go through a little warm-up countdown sequence. So while it's doing that, I will explain that uh, we felt that there are probably, uh, there's an ad for Sanyo here, that there probably were several different ways in which these comb jellies catch their prey because they seem to be able to eat a variety of different kinds of organisms. And we know basically how that they swim, and we know basically that they have some tentacles that are sticky. And the problem was we didn't really know the details of how the prey 
was first would get snagged and then how it would get transferred so it would go into the mouth. We know that they're very effective, efficient predators, so it had to be a pretty slick system, and, and indeed it is. Uh, now, if we're ready to go on that video, Tim, I'll show you a little bit of, uh, we may need to dim the lights a little. The first one we're going to see is Pleurobrachia, the one with the tentacles, the sea gooseberry. And this is the way it looks when it's feeding. Now, all the little things bumping around in here are, are uh, uh, brine shrimp, nopoli, uh, also known as sea monkeys. And, uh, but what we want to see is that the animal holds perfectly still until it decides to catch something or to bring in something which got caught on its tentacles. And when that happens, it pulls the tentacles up, and then, as we'll see in a moment, let me move the camera, it spins around like this, and this has the effect of wiping the tentacle across its mouth so that whatever got stuck on the tentacle gets wiped off. Now, here's another view, and the point of this, could you pause for a moment, please, Tim? Thank you. The point of this is to show us that when this is in its fishing position with the tentacles extended here, as soon as I find the little button, out here, everything is very, very still. There's no motion. Uh, once we start the video again, you'll see that all these little particles suspended in the water are not really moving at all. So the animal is perfectly still, perfectly motionless. The only thing that would be moving would be a prey organism swimming along here, and that prey organism would never be able to detect by its vibration receptors that this thing was there because it's not moving and it's not making any vibration. So that's part of the stealth aspect. Okay, go ahead with the video, please. So it's slowly sort of uh, sinking down a little bit, but basically there's no turbulence or movement around these tentacles which would betray its presence to, now here's somebody swimming around down here, and eventually there's something right there that got caught on the tentacle, and eventually that will get pulled in and we'll see this animal move away to swipe the prey off on into its mouth. There's another, another prey up there that's just about in range of getting caught on these tentacles. So these things can be very stealthy. Now it starts to move. It pulls them in. It's got a few things caught on there, as you can see, and up it goes. All right, now the next one is the other type of uh, feeding behavior by Nemeopsis. And the first sequence here will show you how it, how it causes water to flow around its body and what the significance of that is. Water is being drawn in at the bottom edge here in a very gentle way so that there's very little, uh, it's a very slow flow. Could you run that one again, Tim? Back that up. That's great, thank you. So there's a very slow flow down here, but a quite a rapid flow. You can see by the speed of these particles exiting. So there's almost like a little jet of water that goes out the back here, and that causes the thing to swim slowly forward in that direction, but without creating any turbulence or bow wake in front of it. Now inside, there are various ways in which the tentacles are arranged, and what we're seeing is up inside, this is where the flow of water is going, and there's almost like a brush or a comb arrangement of very fine sticky tentacles and all the water is passing by them and particles in the water are passing by those tentacles also so that they could get stuck on them and ingested. But this tenophore does not want to eat any inert particles, it only wants to eat live food. So as we'll see, there's a difference in behavior whether it's an inert particle or live particle in a moment. Here's another view of the flow of water generated by the vibration of these cilia, uh, particles being entrained in the flow here and moving on up past uh, and out the other end of the tenophore. Right in the center there is the mouth. We'll see more of that later. Now here's what happens when some inert non-living particle comes through. These are, you can see these little things. They're just bits of, little bits of crud, basically. And they're passing through all the, past all these tentacles here, and they pretty much don't get caught. They just go on by. They're not worth eating. 
It's bouncing along a little bit, but it's going to probably get out of there without getting snagged. It's, it's getting caught on the beating of the uh, cilia. But it missed all these tentacles that were, had all these sticky tentacles that were up here. It's just bouncing around in the flow. These are great neon signs, aren't they? There's another inert particle up there that's just kind of meandering around. So the flow is going this way, past the tentacles, and if it's not alive, it just gets kicked around and eventually gets kicked out. Now it's a little different when it's a live prey organism. And let's see, where is it? I think it's this one. It might be that one. These are, yeah, that's alive there, I think. And, oh, it just got snagged right there on the tentacles. You see the little fringe of tentacles? It got caught, and it is going to be eaten. Now, the lobe, I said, is this large sort of fleshy area, and it has several functions, one of which it does participate in locomotion. And you can see that by suddenly contracting it, uh, the animal is able to swim forward uh, rapidly here. Now it's swimming with its comb plates in this direction, and now it contracts and makes a rapid movement in the opposite direction. This is often used as an escape swimming to get away from something. Here's another instance of it. But the lobe is also a very important surface for capturing prey. So we're going to see now is capture of prey on the inner surface. Here the lobes are open around here. And I'm uh, not sure where the prey item is, but I guess it got caught. <laughs> Let's, uh, here's a detail of the edge of the lobe that sort of folds over and, and closes to catch things inside. So it just, it just engulfs them. And then the very lip part also rolls over and traps the prey right on the inside. And we're going to see that down here, I think. There it is. It, there's the prey. And it rolls over and folds it up inside so that it can't escape. Now, this is one of the interesting things which Becky discovered in the behavior of these animals is they have these structures. Could you pause for a second, Tim? Thank you. These structures right here, these are little pointy things. They're called oracles, and there are four of them. They have cilia on them, which beat back and forth. We've been seeing that in all this video. That helps to create the water current. But these are very prehensile structures. They, work, they can work almost like fingers. And it turns out that they have a very specific action in helping to catch prey. OK, go ahead, Tim. Here comes the prey. And what we're going to see in slow motion now is uh, that one of these oracles remember which one. There's a prey item there. There's an oracle. Here's another prey item. More prey. Ah, it reaches out and nails it. Okay? And what it does is it sticks it right down onto a surface that's covered with sticky cilia, which will then act as a conveyor belt to move the prey into the mouth. I think we'll see it again in slow motion. Uh, back in here. Here's the oracle. There's the other oracle. There's a prey on the tip of it. And it's just sticking it down into the groove so that it can be transported up into the mouth. Uh, there's a groove that runs all along there. And it, once the prey gets in that groove, it's just like a conveyor belt. Now we're going to see a little detail of things. Here's a prey animal. And there it is moving along this conveyor belt. This is all done with cilia. And it's going to move it, so it gets in the groove, and whoosh, off it goes. There's no turning back. Once it gets in that groove, it's heading to the mouth. It's a continuous process. These are tentacles. This is now, the tentilli are the very fine, small tentacles. And they catch animals uh, individually. These are the tentilli up here, these little threads. And they catch things by sticking to them, and then that prey gets transferred off of the tentilla into the food groove. I think we're going to see that happening up here someplace. Well, the mouth is really kind of out of the picture. OK, there's, there's the prey right there. It's stuck on this little thread. And it's now going to get transferred down, I believe, into the groove, which is down here. The groove reaches for it, <laughs> you might say. 
uh, this flap of tissue, it's going to get transferred down there. And once it does, OK, just about made it. And it's going to go off into the groove. Now this is, could you pause, please, Tim? Uh, this is a fairly high magnification picture. And so we're not seeing the whole animal. We're just seeing little details down inside. So I can't, you don't see the mouth. You just see little things leading up to it. Uh, everything you saw there, those little prey animals were like less than a millimeter in, in length. Well, uh, I think that's the end of the first video section. Okay, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about is why these animals, we've seen a little bit about how they catch their food. And it's kind of fun to watch, and they're very clever and well adapted to that. But what is it that, beyond that, that makes them such important predators or competitors for, uh, for fish? Uh, there are several things. One is that uh, both the comb jellies and uh, many other kinds of jellyfish have very rapid growth rates and very rapid reproduction rates. So under favorable circumstances, one of them can turn into millions of them in a very short period of time, very quickly. And they can come up so fast that they eat everything that's there, they outcompete everything else, and they sometimes also can uh, spend the rest of the year sort of out of sight, out of mind, nobody really knows they're there, until conditions are right, and then they suddenly uh, develop very uh, large populations. So they're important not only because of their feeding capabilities and the fact that they can eat a lot of different kinds of things very rapidly and efficiently, but because there suddenly can be huge numbers of them. Uh, this also makes them important and uh, very effective as invaders. Uh, you're probably familiar with the idea of invasive species or introduced species that come from somewhere else, they come over to a new environment and all of a sudden they just take over or they turn the whole ecosystem upside down in some ways. The jellies are very good at being invaders for a lot of reasons and just as some examples of invasive jellyfish, uh, this is a true jellyfish, and one which invaded the uh, Gulf of Mexico the last uh, year or two. Uh, this jellyfish is, uh, I'm not sure it even has a common name, but it is uh, as much as uh, two feet across in this direction. And they were so abundant in parts of the Gulf of Maine that you could practically walk on them. And they had a tremendous effect on the shrimp fishing industry there. And the interesting thing is that this jellyfish is native to Australia and it has somehow managed to get all the way to the Caribbean and then into the Gulf of Mexico, possibly by being transported in the ballast water of ships. These jellyfishes have a benthic attached stage, a very small inconspicuous polyp stage that lives attached to something which can survive adverse conditions. And this, like many other species that have been transported around the world accidentally, may have done so in the ballast water that ships carry that, that go from one place to another in the world. And it was introduced possibly that way, into the Caribbean several years ago, and in recent years has made its way up into the Gulf of Mexico. There are some other big jellyfish that occur down there. This is another one uh, that can be, again, uh, a couple of feet in diameter and a huge jellyfish with, with so many tentacles down here that they just about eat everything that's in, in the water. But the one that's been the most effective in terms of uh, its effect uh, on, on an established fishery uh, has been uh, Nemeopsis, the tinophore that we've been talking about. Now, uh, I want to thank Rich Harbison for uh, the information on this slide, but he's, uh, he's sort of summarized what the characteristics of a, a good invading species are. And we've mentioned some of them already, a high reproductive rate, a high dispersal rate that is able to spread itself out over large areas. Uh, Ideally, uh, single parent reproduction, that is not having to have males and females, but being able to do it all with one hermaphroditic or asexual individual. And that's true of many uh, tinophores, in fact, almost all tinophores. Uh, a wide native range, that is, it lives in a wide variety of environments in its normal uh, place that it lives, able to eat a lot of different kinds of food, live in many different kinds of environments. And that all adds up to this Nemeopsis that we've been talking about. It can live in water from almost fresh water it lives in the upper reaches of rivers of the Chesapeake uh, in salinities of, that are about a quarter of what seawater is, all the way out into the open ocean. It lives in a wide range of temperatures from nearly uh, freezing up to probably in the middle um, uh, 70s uh, seawater. Uh, 
uh, and it eats a whole variety of different things by the mechanisms that we've just seen. Now, you put that together with the characteristics of an easily invaded environment, and some of those are that it's uh, similar to the natural habitat. Uh, it may be disturbed in some way. It may have a low diversity of species that already live there, and it may not have any predators that would eat the invader if it were there. This is a pretty good description of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, which are the places in Asia where this tenophore, Nemeopsis, has been introduced, again, through ship's ballast water, approximately 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, these are oceans uh, or seas, landlocked seas, at least uh, uh, partially landlocked seas, which have a low diversity of species, which have, uh, have been disturbed for many years, both by fishing pressure and by pollution from the Soviet Union and surrounding countries. And when this invader invaded these places, it had a tremendous effect on the fisheries there. The, uh, the important fish, well, first of all, let me remind you about, uh, about where Nemeopsis normally lives. This is a view of the Earth with the North Pole up there, the Atlantic Ocean, North America, South America, and the black dots are the locations where Nemeopsis occurs, all the way from uh, essentially Cape Cod, is about the northern limit, all the way down the coast, all the way around the Gulf of Mexico, in the Caribbean, uh, at the coast of South America, all the way down to Argentina. Not on the Pacific coast, and not normally on the coast of Europe or of Africa, but you can see for an invader, it has a very wide range of, uh, of normal habitats from all the way up here through the tropics down here. And so it has now extended this range so that it is endemic over here in the Black Sea, recently in the Caspian Sea here, and has now also been introduced into the Mediterranean. So what are the fish that are in danger over there? It's not cod and haddock like we have here but a couple of, uh, of anchovy-type fish and herring-like fish, uh, clipeid fish, which have been for many years the basis of important fisheries in the Black and Caspian Sea, uh, uh, fished by Russia and by Turkey and by Iran. Now, what happened when this tenophore was introduced is shown here. This is the catch of fi these fishes uh, for uh, this one, the anchovy. Uh, that's uh, caught over there. Uh, over the years, from 1963, this is the total catch between both the USSR, former Soviet Union, and Turkey. And you can see it goes up and down and up and down. But this right here is when the Tinafort invaded. And you see there's a drastic plummeting of uh, the population of these fishes as a result of that. Now, we also see that there is a little bit of an increase here in a few years later. Interestingly enough, this does not coincide with any biological event, but a political event. It coincides with the collapse of the Soviet Union and, and the collapse of the Soviet economy. And when that happened, there was no longer any fuel for fishing boats in the Black Sea. And what you see here is the Russian fishing effort going to zero because they didn't have any fuel for their boats. And so uh, the slight upturn in the catch pretty much just reflects what the Turks were catching and a little bit left. Uh, so between uh, Turkey, Russia, and the Tinafors, all the fish were getting caught. And it just, the Russians were out of luck because they didn't have any fuel. So this is a, a situation which uh, has been going on for about uh, 10 or 12 years. Uh, what's going to happen there? Well, we're not sure uh, what's going to happen to it. There's some possible solutions. One is that uh, a predator uh, on the tenophore has now appeared. And that may, in time, uh, sort of normalize the situation. Uh, it may be that if the fishing activity continues to be low for other economic reasons, that it will help to balance this out. But we really don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. Uh, there are other possible things one could do that you could try to introduce other species uh, to control it. And that has both uh, pros and cons to it. But another question this brings up is, should we be worried about Nemeopsis in our own environment? This is, it normally lives here. Is there anything unusual going on with it? Well, actually, in the last few years, it's been becoming much more abundant in a lot of places. One of those places is in Narragansett Bay. And there are several things that, uh, that 
uh, I can tell you about Nemeopsis in Narragansett Bay. This is work by my colleague Barbara Sullivan at University of Rhode Island. And what she's done here is to compare the, the time of year when Nemeopsis appears in Narragansett Bay between 1971 and 1999. And you can see that in 1971, the peak abundance of Nemeopsis was right here in September. Uh, in 1999, the peak abundance of Nemeopsis has shifted to approximately the end of June or early July, much earlier in the year. Now, correlated with that is the fact that temperatures, water temperatures, shown over here, uh, seem to be higher in more recent years, 1999 is the open circles, than in 1971. And the pattern of increase in temperature with the season, the pattern is the same, but the absolute temperature is higher. So that in June, in 1999, the temperature was much more similar to what it was in September in 1971. So it may be that the temperature has some relationship to the appearance of the tenophores. But there's another interesting uh, feature. First of all, we can see here in this top plot, we have the abundance of copepods, the main prey, and the black circles. And it starts out very high here in early June. And then it crashes uh, a little bit later. And it is quite low for a while and only uh, comes up again later on in the year. The other line here are the tenophores. Uh, the tenophores start out very low. They have a sudden increase in their numbers. I told you how quickly they can reproduce, how quickly they can grow. And that is accompanied by a drastic reduction in the number of copepods because they're eating them all. Uh, the tenophore population then goes through some ups and downs, but pretty much levels out here by August. And then the copepod population begins to rebuild. So it looks as though there's a very striking effect on the copepods of that population of tenophores. Now, the other interesting feature has to do with the relationship between the tenophores and larval fish and fish eggs. These plots are the abundance of fish eggs and fish larvae during the season. And you can see that they start to go up sharply in uh, April and May, and, and the fish larvae a little bit later, June and July. This band shows the period that we saw before of maximum abundance of Nemeopsis in this earlier period. We had a plot before for 1971. In this whole period, the Nemeopsis occurred much later in the year. And it occurred after, well after, the peak abundance of fish legs and fish larvae. Now it's getting there earlier. It's getting there in June. It's getting there at the same time as the fish larvae and fish eggs reach their maximum. It makes for good eating for the Nemeopsis. It's there at a much better time of year. Now, we're not sure how this has come about, whether it's coincidence, whether it's just a function of the fact that the, warmers, the water is a little warmer earlier, and it's just basically lucked out that it got there when all the fish is there or whether there's something more complicated going on. Now, I mentioned before in that map of distribution that Cape Cod is usually considered to be the northern limit on this coast for the distribution of Nemeopsis. However, last summer, it was found for the first time in Boston Harbor. This is work done by Jeff Turner at University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. And he, as part of the uh, survey program for the big, uh, not the big dig, but for the uh, MWRA, the sewer pipe, outfall pipe. There's been a long uh, survey program going on that monitors zooplankton, among other things. And in their stations, they compared the stations where they found Nemeopsis for the first time ever with stations where they found no Nemeopsis. And this is the difference in the amount of zooplankton that they collected at those stations. So once again, we have evidence that Nemeopsis has now been introduced into a place that it never was before in Boston Harbor. We don't know how it got there, whether it swam around Provincetown and managed to get itself up Cape Cod Bay into Boston Harbor, or whether it got there by some other means. But all of a sudden, it's having a huge impact on the biology up there. Well, so what, um, what can we or anybody else do about this, or should we? Well, nature does fight back to some extent. Uh, and I mentioned that there are some natural predators. And if we could uh, see the next slide, please, Tim. Uh, next one after that. 
One of the natural predators that's very effective on uh, Nemeopsis is another tenophore, this one right here called Baroe. Uh, this is another tenophore, which again is sort of a big swimming stomach. It has a mouth at this end, which can open very wide. It has its comb rows here for propulsion, but everything inside here is basically stomach. And what it can do in the next slide is act as a very effective predator. Here's the, the Nemeopsis. And here's the Baroe, and it's encountered it, and has opened its mouth really wide, and has engulfed as much of it as it could. And what it can't engulf, it actually bites off. Now, how does it do that, you might ask? It's only made of jelly, it doesn't have any teeth, but what it does have are very special structures called macrocilia, that are, again, are made of cilia, they're bundles of cilia, they're like if you had a series of long, thin fibers that were all bundled together with a sheath around them, it would make a fairly stiff and sturdy uh, instrument. And this has teeth made of these macrocilia which line its mouth and enable it to bite through this tissue. So this is one important natural predator and the one which is now uh, in some fashion, probably also by ballast water, been uh, introduced into the Black Sea uh, where it may take care of this problem. We don't know. Uh, the next slide please. There are also parasites which have a role in the controlling the populations. Here's one of these uh, tenophores, the uh, sea gooseberry type, and here's the parasite, which is a worm, uh, a marine worm that actually burrows into the tissue, burrows into the jelly, and lives inside this thing and consumes part of it. The next picture <clears throat> is looking down inside an emiopsis again, a sort of a high magnification view. Just to orient you, the mouth is down over here, the top of the animal is up here, and what we're seeing here is part of the upper part of the stomach and the sort of the circulatory system. But what we also see here, these things, are, these worm-like animals are parasites living inside the Nemeopsis. They are actually the larval stages of a sea anemone, small sea anemone. Uh, and every year here, in beginning in August and well, maybe a little later, beginning probably September, October, these things show up and pretty soon they parasitize all of the Nemeopsis. Every one of them will have these things living in it. Now, we're not entirely sure just what effect this has on the Nemeopsis. They don't seem to mind too much, but uh, eventually the population disappears, and so this may play a role in making that happen. Next slide, please. And then there are larger and, and more attractive predators for these animals. These are the ocean sunfish, Mola Mola. They're specialized predators on all kinds of jelly animals, uh, from uh, big jellyfishes, siphonophores, tenophores, whatever. They have a digestive tract which is about a mile and a half long uh, in order to digest all of this jelly to get all the water and salt out and, and, and extract that small amount of nutrient which these animals contain. Uh, but we've also found that uh, some of the local fish around here are also pretty effective at fighting back. And if we can see the next uh, video clip, please, Tim. This is some more work from Rich Harbison, who uh, found that uh, the butterfish, which occurs locally in, in the bays and along the coast here, is a pretty good at, uh, at getting back at the jellies. Here's the Nemeopsis right here, and here's the butterfish uh, attacking and basically making jelly mincemeat of, of that. Uh, this may be, uh, play a role in the final collapse of the jelly populations. This is um, a different thing. This is Aurelia, the moon jelly, which also occurs in our waters. And the butterfish, as you can see, it's taking pretty good sized nips out of, the, uh, out of the edge of this thing. And there's really not much the jellyfish can do about it, except sit there and take it. Uh, so these fish and other fish like them, which are specialized, or at least partly specialized to eat jelly some of the time, may play a role in controlling these populations uh, on our coast and in places where they, they normally live together with uh, Nemeopsis. Uh, well, I'd like to um, summarize here a few points. Uh, Certainly, I think I, I've tried to convince you that tenophores and other jellies can be very important predators on zooplankton. They can also, many of them can eat fish eggs and fish larvae directly. And of course, some of the larger things like the Portuguese man o' war and some of the bigger jellyfish can eat adult fish directly. Uh, their population biology enables them to 
develop very large seasonal blooms that come up very quickly, cover large areas with high biomass so they can eat a lot of what's there and reduce the food supply available to larval fish. By understanding the feeding mechanisms, we can get a better idea of, of what effect they might have in different kinds of ecosystems depending on what types of prey organisms are there. Uh, they're very good as invading species for many because their life history properties are well suited to that. There do appear to be some increases in their populations in our area in the recent years. Not only the tinafores, but uh, from, we've had a couple of years of very high populations of other big jellyfish washing up on the beaches. Some of you may have encountered those. Uh, and we're not entirely sure why that is. But I think finally, uh, for me, the most important uh, point is that uh, they're very fascinating, beautiful animals, uh, not really fully understood or appreciated in their role in the ecosystem. They've been around for hundreds of millions of years, and, uh, and I hope that you enjoyed the chance to see a little bit more about them. Thank you very much. Put the last slide up, Tim. That's a jellyfish, that lives in the deep sea. It's about this big, and we don't know much about what it eats, but there's a lot more to be learned about these animals. Question? What is a jellyfish actually made of? Ah, it's about 99% water and half a percent salt. And uh, it's, um, they're, very, they're simple animals in the sense that um, they only have two layers of actual cellular tissue, basically one cell thick. And that is enclosing a mass of basically non-cellular, non-living jelly material. I mean, if you find one on the beach and it's just a lump of jelly, that's because it's mostly made of this material. It's called mesoglea. Uh, it's a lot, got a lot of water in it. It's long chain uh, polysaccharides and proteins and things that hold it all together. Uh, but most of the body tissue is this non-cellular material. And the rest of it is really quite, quite simple. There are muscle fibers. They don't have muscles that are the same as ours, really, but there's muscle fibers throughout it. And they can contract together, and they, you know, so it can swim and, and twitch around and things. Yeah. Oh, sorry, over there. How do they glow? Good question. Um, a lot of them are, are luminous, luminescent. Have you seen them glowing at night at the beach? Okay, big kind of greenish blue blobs. Right. The ones that are like that that you're seeing, that's Nemeopsis, the, ones we, the one we've been talking about. They're very bright, luminous animals. Almost all comb jellies are luminous, and many of the other jellies are too. Uh, they glow. Uh, it's all done with chemistry. Uh, by mixing together two kinds of chemicals in their, in their body or in their tissues, which when they come together, create the light. Have you ever had those little glow, glow sticks or like those glow bracelets you get on the 4th of July, you put around your neck? You seen those? Well, it's a similar idea. There's two chemicals in there. You break something, it mixes them up, and it starts to glow. See, they got that idea from the jellyfish. <laughs> jellyfish invented it first. And there's also a, uh, a protein uh, it's called green fluorescent protein that comes from a jellyfish. And that protein has now been isolated, and the, the gene that makes that protein is now understood. And people can use that to make other things glow. And uh, for instance, uh, they've used it to make things like rabbits and frogs glow. <laughs> Have you heard about that? Yeah. Yes, question back there. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the whole question. Oh, the dots in the middle of the lion's mane jellyfish. Um, that's a good question. Is that an egg? I don't think so, but I'm not absolutely positive. Um, they, they do have. They do produce eggs inside, but the eggs, I'm pretty sure, are pretty small, and I don't think that they're red. Uh, there is a lot of pigment inside that jellyfish, and there are some special uh, 
uh, organs inside there that help with digestion. And those might be what you're, what you're seeing. But I better look that one up. Yes? Well, um, the comb jellies are, are hermaphrodites. So a single animal produces both eggs and sperm. And it can fertilize itself. So that's a big advantage right there. Uh, doesn't have to have a mate. They produce a lot of eggs that they shed into the water. They produce a sperm at the same time. If there's several of them around, you do get cross-fertilization. Uh, a lot of these animals will have sort of some sort of a synchronization of the spawning so that uh, it, it, because of a change in temperature or a change in the light, uh, they'll all do it at once. And then you get tremendously uh, successful fertilization. Uh, they can grow. The, the comb jellies like Nemeopsis can develop from the fertilized egg stage to a little larval uh, tenophore in uh, probably a, about a day, a little less than a day. And then they start feeding right away. And because their, their bodies are mostly water, uh, it doesn't take a lot of food to make themselves bigger. And uh, so by continuously feeding, they can grow to their full adult size in just a matter of a few days. Because you, do you see it on the beach? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it might be. It's. Uh, I mean, none of them swim really very strongly, and pleurobrachia. It's. It's fairly tough. The little body is fairly tough. It'll roll around in the surf, and you can pick it up off the sand. Tentacles get ripped off generally, uh, and it may strand. You may see it more because of the other kinds would get ripped up so much you wouldn't recognize it. But that little that little round ball of pleurobrachia is pretty pretty tough. And so it may be a matter of what actually survives the stranding process. OK, I'm sorry. Back there? Yeah, I used to share an office with Ken Lewis Davenport years ago mm -hmm. to debate what the relationship might be between tenophores and salivates. Does DNA offer any answer? Yeah, it does. Um, what, what the DNA data says is they're not particularly closely related. And although they superficially may appear to be so, um, they're actually quite, quite separate. Uh, so they, they, have, they have separate origins pretty far back in the, the phylogeny, but uh, there's not any particularly close connection. Sorry, you had 